Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I am so happy to see you all today and to welcome you to this new event for Explorer Classroom. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration. Half of National and Geographic Education, wonder. I am so happy to see you all today and to welcome you to this you new event One second to remove this little feedback classroom. loop. At National Geographic, we believe, brilliant, all better. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration and of wonder to change the world. The heart of the National Geographic community is of course our National Geographic explorers who are cutting edge scientists and researchers they're transformative educators and really powerful storytellers. And the Explorer Classroom Program is designed to connect those amazing folks with students all around the world. Today, we're very, very lucky to be connecting with Erica Woolsey. Erica is a marine biologist who loves being underwater and especially loves exploring beautiful and threatened coral reefs. She's joining us today to give us a glimpse of life as a National Geographic Explorer and to teach us all a little bit about coral reefs, the threats that they face, and the ecosystems that are depending on them. But before she does that, I'd like to acknowledge that it's not just Erica and me today. We've got a couple different student groups up on screen with us, and we have over 900 more students registered to join live online with us. So thank you all for being here. Today we're representing places all around the world. We've got Alabama, Arizona, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Maryland, Michigan, Mississippi, Missouri, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Texas, Virginia, Washington, Washington, DC, Wisconsin, Puerto Rico, Australia, Belgium, Canada, India, Uganda. There's all kinds of places represented here today. If I missed you, tell us in the chat bar where you're located. We'd love to give you a special shout out and definitely tell your friends to come watch too. See how long you can make me talk for. I wonder how many states I can say in one breath. <laughs> anyway, I've got a couple of special shout outs for groups who are new to Explorer Classroom. We've got McKinley, Louise, Grace, the Radburn School, and Miss Franco's Science Class here with us today. Um, we think you're great and we're so happy to welcome you to the Explorer Classroom family. And now that is plenty from me. It's finally time to turn it over to Erica Woolsey for today's Explorer Classroom lesson. Wow, thank you so much, Celeste. And it's so exciting to have everybody joining us, especially from all over the world. One of my favorite sayings is that the ocean doesn't divide us, it connects us. So I hope that today when we talk about marine biology and life underwater, we can think about the ways that we're all connected. And it's pretty cool that we're able to virtually connect here today. And you may not believe it, but I'm not actually diving on a coral reef right now. <laughs> um, behind me, you see some beautiful Moorish idol fish and some corals on a coral reef, but it is my favorite place to be in the world. I love diving on coral reefs. Um, and my video isn't working. Oh, here it is. Here I am swimming around. Um, I like to scuba dive and I've been scuba diving for about, wow, almost 20 years now. And so see that tank on my back? That's filled with compressed air. And so it allows me to breathe underwater. And sometimes I like to think of myself as a real life mermaid. And I, not only do I love diving in the real ocean, but here I am in some aquarium exhibits. And so I love interacting with people while I'm underwater through the glass. So in a way, that's also what I'm doing right now. And just being underwater for me is just so calming and so fun. And I just love floating and seeing all the cool things that I never get to see on land. And that's led me to become a marine scientist. And so that means that I spend a lot of time underwater looking at things and observing them. And then I write them down. So if you notice in this picture, not only do I have the tank on my back with my compressed air so I can breathe, I also have a mask on my face so that I can see. And I'm carrying a couple of things. That big white square is called a quadrat. And I gently lay it down on the sea floor and that helps me measure exactly what I'm looking at. And so if I keep putting it down in random places over and over and over again, I write down what I see on that clipboard. And that clipboard's pretty special because I use it to write underwater. It's a regular old pencil, but the paper is special for underwater writing. 
So that's how I collect all of my data and make all of my observations, especially when I want to understand what's going on on coral reefs. So coral reefs are just incredible ecosystems. That means there are lots of different types of animals and plant-like animals living together. And so here we see some fish swimming in some nice clear blue water with the sun coming down. And these sort of um, almost like plant-like bushes coming up, those are actually corals. And corals are animals, not plants. Even though they stay pretty still, they are growing, they're reproducing, they're providing food for a lot of other animals that live on the reef. And they're the basis of the whole habitat because they basically turn seawater into rock. So these animals are absolutely incredible. So they build the physical reef structure that supports so much life in the ocean. And for that reason, they're called the rainforests of the ocean because they're so biodiverse. And biodiverse means that they have many different types of life. Now, this is a, a video that's going to show you how animals move. Um, so corals are often thought of rocks because they produce rocks, or they, they're thought as plants because they kind of look like plants. But in this video, you can see close up and sped up, coral animals move around a lot. And you can see they have these tentacles around a central mouth that they use to uh, get some food out of the water. And they're very simple animals. They're a lot like um, sea anemones. So they have soft bodies and they're clear, but they also have lots of different types of things living inside of them, including types of proteins. And most importantly, something called zooxanthellae. So zooxanthellae is sort of like a, a type of plant-like organism that lives inside the coral animal and it photosynthesizes, meaning it takes energy from the sun and turns it into food. So then the coral can use that food to turn seawater into rock. So it's this really cool cycle of how things work on the reef and how these animals are able to support such tremendous biodiversity. So here's a little diagram showing you uh, the relationship between the coral animal and the zooxanthellae. And this relationship is called symbiosis. And symbiosis means that both organisms benefit. So both the coral and the zooxanthellae get a lot out of this partnership. And so the coral gets food, the zooxanthellae also gets food because it uh, survives on the waste of the coral and a place to live. So here's that picture of a healthy coral reef again. And I wanna show you um, a special prop I have. So this is a 3D printed model of a coral colony. And so I, with my team actually collected this in the wild. And so we took lots of photographs while we're swimming around different angles of the coral and we stitched them together into a 3D model using computer software. And with that, we were able to measure it and understand it. And if anybody's interested in looking at coral 3D models, we have them available online um, that you can download for free. And if you have access to a 3D printer, you can even print them out. And so we painted this one. Um, so this is just a reproduction of a coral. The real coral is still alive and well on the reef, we hope. And so we've painted it to be the color of a healthy coral. So this particular species can sometimes be pink. And it's this structure where a lot of different animals live inside between the branches that is that important three dimensional aspect of the reef that supports the habitat. But what happens when that symbiosis I described and that relationship between the algae and the coral breaks down? So what's been happening recently and is actually happening right now is that temperatures have been getting higher than normal in the ocean. And that can cause the coral animal to stress out 
and expel their zooxanthellae. So the algae that helps them live, they kick out because they're just too stressed. And because the coral animals are clear, without their zooxanthellae friends, you can see through the coral animal to their white skeleton, which is the sort of rock that they build made out of something called calcium carbonate. And so it appears white. And that is called coral bleaching. And so if you look at this model, we've painted a little section white to try to visualize what that is like when a this is a partially bleached coral colony. And what that means is that the reef starts to starve without their zooxanthellae friends. And so over time, it might degrade into um, just coral rubble, which can get taken over by um, like big uh, macroalgae that smothers the reef and completely changes it. And that's bad news for a lot of animals that live on the reef, including if you see here, uh, anemone fish. So these, these little fish that you might recognize as a type of Nemo fish, they also live on the reef and they depend on the corals to stay healthy. So the good news though, is that corals are so incredible that they can grow back. And here we have a reef um, in Australia where I uh, studied and lived for a number of years. And this is on One Tree Island Reef from a study that I did in 2012. And in 2008, this reef was hit by a cyclone. So it was completely wiped out. So if you see before, and after. Notice how there were so many different types of shapes and colors and corals. And then after it was just like a moonscape. And so that was pretty distressing. However, over time, because this reef was really lucky in that it, temperatures didn't get too high and the people that lived there protected it so you couldn't fish there or do any other type of damage, it started to uh, grow back. So if you go from here to here in just about 10 years, we see the reef coming back, which is really, really exciting. And so the message here is that yes, coral reefs can recover. We just have to give them the space so that they can do so. So another really cool project that I'm working on is to take more people diving with me virtually. And so my favorite thing to do in the world is to be underwater. And I really love taking other people underwater too. I'm a dive master. I love leading dives. I love swimming with my friends. I love teaching people how to dive and swim. However, I, you know, there's only one of me and I want millions of people to go diving with me. And so that's why I started playing with virtual reality. And so these headsets, which look like dive masks <laughs> are designed so that you can wear them on your face and feel like you're going on a dive with me. And so this I do through my organization called the Hydris, which is all about virtual learning. So if you look up the Hydris, you might be able to go virtual diving, especially if you, especially if you have um, a VR headset. And another option is a cardboard viewer. So these cardboard viewers, you can even make them yourselves. Uh, you can also buy them online. My friend Hassan here is demonstrating that there are so many places you can go underwater or anywhere in the world with a cardboard viewer just using your smartphone. So if you have a smartphone, you can put it into the viewer and then look at some 360 content and feel immersed in a new place. And so this is a picture of one of my good friends named Rick, who used this really special kind of camera uh, called the Virtual 2, which takes video all around you. And so you can notice that the cameras point in all directions so that when we stitch it together, we create a movie but it's 360 degrees. So you can look up, you can look down, you look, can look everywhere and you feel like you're in the ocean. And so again, if anyone has access to virtual reality equipment, we have this film called Immerse. And 
it's free to download. Um, and we're hoping to make it more and more accessible, especially on uh, YouTube and Facebook as soon as we can. But we want it to be free so that more and more people can come diving and experience what it's like to be underwater. And another really cool thing I got to do with my friends at National Geographic, including Celeste, is I got to take about 400 people diving with me at once. So if you look at this theater, all of those people sitting down have virtual reality headsets on their heads and they are on the coral reef. So they feel like they're diving and they're all diving together. And there I am on stage, they can't see me, <laughs> but they can hear me and I'm, I'm narrating and I'm walking them through the dive. And here we get to, got to swim with manta rays together. We got to swim with sharks together. And so my hope is that um, when people get to visit the ocean, whether it's in real life or virtually, they feel interested and they feel connected and it feels fun. So I just wanted to show you this picture of me when I was a little kid. Um, here I am, I'm tide pooling near my house in California, meaning I'm looking at different animals and going looking at rocks at low tide. And I hope I was very gentle with them. And I hope I was asking lots of questions because I know it was that early exploration that led me to some discoveries to, to follow my curiosities and go even deeper into the ocean. And now that I'm back on land, I wanna take more and more people into the ocean to show how great it is. So thank you so much for coming diving with me <laughs> on this, um, um, National Geographic special, and I'm just so happy to be a part of it. And I would love to spend a lot of time answering any questions you have. I think I can help with that. Erica, that was amazing. Thank you so much. But to quick take a quick detour, um, all of you wonderful students at home, I actually have a special challenge for you guys to do later this afternoon. I would love to hear what your favorite thing you learned today from Erica is. So. A National Geographic Education is asking you to do a short project and show us. So maybe this afternoon you could draw a picture or a comic strip of something that you learned from Erica, or maybe write a short story or a news article about her, or even produce a video that you could send to a family member or a friend to teach them your favorite thing. But if you're going to accept this challenge, which we hope you do, please make sure you show us your work so that we can show Erica. Um, you can send it to us on Twitter, at Nat Geo Education hashtag explorer classroom and then Erica can see all of your favorite things but it's definitely time to ask some questions so if you're watching online you can send in questions too type them right into the chat bar I'll ask as many as I can on your behalf and let's take our first question from Luke and Chloe your microphone's on now nice loud voice for me um what is your favorite marine animal and where did you see it oh great question I'm gonna give you two answers. One is a big animal and that's a whale shark. So I got to swim with whale sharks in Australia and they're the world's largest fish. And they're a type of shark. Mean, so the sharks mean that their tail moves from side to side. And what moves their tail up and down? Do you know Luke and Chloe? Are they muted? Uh, they're still no they're not oh, dolphin yeah dolphin. so dolphins and whales they move their tail up and down so that's how you know they're marine mammals but fish and sharks move their tail front from side to side so whale sharks are these really big fish and even though they're sharks like a lot of sharks they're actually very gentle and so swimming near them makes you feel very safe and very small and they have this beautiful blue spotted pattern on them so i felt very privileged to swim with whale sharks and then for my small animals, I really like coral, obviously, because, you know, that's my favorite, you know, it's what I study. But I really also want you to learn about nudibranchs. And nudibranchs are really little uh, sea slugs that are all sorts of colors and have all sorts of strange shapes and really cool stories about what they can do. So I highly recommend nudibranchs and whale sharks. <laughs> We've got a bunch of people in the chat bar wondering about other types of coral. Would you be able to list yeah. a couple of your favorites for us? Yes. And so this coral behind me is a turbinaria. 
And so it's sort of like a flat foliaceous coral and it has a really cool, almost like cabbage like shape. Um, I also really like this one. It's a uh, Stylophora pistillata, <laughs> um, which I like it because it has these like really cool like electric blue or bright pink colors, which are really fun. Um, also Ac Acropora or a branching staghorn coral is really beautiful and they can produce these uh, really amazing almost forest like areas. Um, and you know, they're really important for the ecosystem and corals come in all shapes and sizes and colors. And I love them all. And I actually study coral reproduction. So I'm really interested in how different types of corals make coral babies. And there's, um, there's one that I really like called a Goniastria fabulous, uh, which its common name is honeycomb coral. And it has both male and female cells. And so it can actually self fertilize as well as clone itself. So it's pretty fascinating what sort of strategies uh, animals use underwater to reproduce and persevere. So cool, thank you. Let's grab a question from Ryan and Lucy. I'm gonna turn your microphone on now. Um, so I was wondering, so you, you showed the picture of how there was like the coral after it died and like rejuvenated and so I was, I read somewhere where they were doing studies of how like playing different sounds of a healthy coral helped it um, grow. So I was wondering if you um, noticed or knew any like tricks like that, that have helped with um, the coral regrowing. That is an awesome question, Lucy. And it's some really cool research that has come out recently because yes, a healthy reef is really loud because you hear all sorts of animals like scratching on the coral. You hear parrotfish eating algae and scraping coral. Like some people describe it as sort of a snap, crackle, pop sound. Like it's very active. And um, a lot of what are called bio eroders, which are sort of nestling and scratching and scraping the coral, as well as different things like hunting and chasing. And so it's a loud space and marine organisms can, can hear. And so even little fish or even little coral babies can sense these sounds and actually are attracted to those sounds because they know that that's what a healthy reef sounds like. Whereas a, a, a dying or sick reef is a lot quieter. And so I've dived on a few um, uh, dying reefs and it's really sad and quiet and some scientists have found that when they put speakers on the reef and play those noises, more fish come to aggregate there, which is really interesting. So then my question to all of you is how can we use that information? Um, does that mean we should put a bunch of speakers on the reef? Or you know, does it mean that we should uh, look at other ways to um, protect reefs as well? So these are really good questions about how we can translate scientific discovery into action. Awesome. We've got a bunch of people online. Samuel asked this. I know a lot of other people did too. Um, they're wondering about what the process to become a certified diver is like and, and maybe how yes. old you have to be. Yes. Yeah, so it varies depending on where you are and what, um, uh, what uh, society or um, organization you do it through. So I did mine through PADI. PADI. Um, there's also other organizations like SSI and you start as a recreational diver. And I was 18 when I first learned how to dive, but I believe you can do it uh, at a younger age. Uh, I think even 13 or 14, um, as long as you have parent permission. And the process is you take classes. So you learn all about diving and how it works and all about the safety and how you, you know, keep yourself breathing underwater. Um, and then you get into the water. You start in a pool and then they put you into the ocean um, or into a lake, depending on where you are. And what I really like is that there's a guide with you the whole time to make sure that you feel safe. And um, after a while, it starts to feel natural. I remember when I first started diving, it felt really scary and strange because I wasn't used to being underwater and breathing at the same time. It can feel a little freaky. 
All right, let's grab a question from the Burns family. Your microphone's on, nice and loud for us. Have you ever heard of the Jubilee in Mobile Coast or Mobile Bay? No, can you tell me about it? Yeah, no, no, no. I don't know about it. Her question is, we have a thing called the Jubilee and it's where the oxygen is depleted in the water and all That's sorts fine. of things come up onto the shore. And we were wondering if you knew anything about it or how climate change would be affecting that in our future. Thank you. So I haven't heard about the Jubilee specifically, but I'm gonna look it up. Um, it sounds a lot like that might be eutrophication. So where oxygen leaves the water. And so you have um, uh, what, what are called anoxic areas so that animals suffocate essentially. And so a big cause of that is um, runoff. So especially where rivers meet the water, bringing things like fertilizers and um, other types of nutrients from land. When that goes into the water on the coast, it causes an abundance of nutrients, which causes algae blooms. And so then those algae, they, they end up decomposing, which takes all of the oxygen out of the water, which makes it really hard for the natural ecosystem to survive. And so we're seeing that unfortunately all over the world, including on coral reefs. And it can be um, pretty tricky. And even though that that's caused by um, runoff and uh, nutrients in the water, it can also be exacerbated by the effects of climate change, especially if you have temperature rise in the ocean as well, that makes it even harder for the um, marine ecosystem to persevere and recover. Thank you for telling me about the Jubilee. I'm gonna learn all about it. Brilliant. All right, we've got a couple quick questions. Um, Maeve and Joel want to know what the funniest thing that's ever happened to you on a dive is. And John Silverwood wants to know uh, what the deepest you ever dove was. Ooh, okay. F a lot of funny things happen underwater. Um, sometimes I laugh so hard that I lose a lot of my air. <laughs> Um, but something I love to do with my dive buddies is we take out our regulator, which is what we breathe from, and we just blow bubbles up into the air and we can turn them into bubble rings. So it's really fun to do that. And sometimes we do flips. Sometimes we, um, you know, play with each other and get each other's attention with uh, clinging our tanks. Um, and I've seen just animals act in really funny ways. Um, I mean, the way an octopus moves and changes color, I think is absolutely hilarious, especially if they're covering themselves with something. Um, they're very smart animals and they always crack me up. And the deepest I've dived, um, scuba diving, is about 40 meters, which is about 120 feet deep. And so I dive with um, normal compressed air but there are a lot of divers that are technical divers or they use something called rebreather to dive even deeper. And then of course, there are lots of people who are taking submarines all the way to the bottom of the ocean. So I hope I get to go that deep one day. Agreed, I definitely do too. We've got one more student group up on screen with us. I'm gonna turn your microphone on now. Do you boys have any questions for Erica? Christian, go ahead. Uh, That's you... about submarine. Have you been in a submarine before? I have been in a submarine um, with my family when I was a kid. Um, we had a sort of fun trip. I think it was to uh, Florida actually. And we went down in a submarine and saw life underwater. And I think that really made me want to spend a lot more time underwater. Have you been in a submarine? No. No. Is that something she's talking to you? Is that something you'd like to do one day? Yes, yes. I hope so. Maybe we can go together. <laughs> if they don't take you up on the offer, I certainly <laughs> We've got a bunch of folks online, including Yvonne, who's wondering what would happen if coral were to disappear. Mm. That's a really great question. And so as I mentioned, uh, coral reefs support these huge ecosystems. 
And that includes small animals like shrimp and crabs and nudibranchs, but it also includes big animals like fish and sharks and whales and dolphins. And it also supports humans. And so coral reef regions support hundreds of millions of people all over the world. They provide food, uh, coral reefs provide food, they provide livelihood, especially for tourism. So there are a lot of fisher, fishing communities that really need coral reefs. And so one of my big worries is what's going to happen to people if coral reefs disappear. Um, but the good news is we have so many wonderful, smart people and communities that are working really hard to protect and preserve their reefs for future generations. Awesome. Luke and Chloe, you guys are so patient. I'm turning on your microphone. What's your next question? So um, have you ever seen an, un an endangered animal underwater and where have you seen it? Yes. So actually on this exact reef that's behind me, I saw a Napoleon wrasse. And Napoleon wrasse are these big, beautiful, colorful fish with like big bumpy foreheads. And they are endangered and they also live to be about 30 years old, which is pretty old for a fish. And I also uh, get to dive with sea turtles and sea turtles are just so cool and so fun to watch float around the reef. Um, but unfortunately they too are endangered. And so a big part of what I do when I'm underwater is I'm very respectful of their space. I don't want to stress them out. I just patiently watch them interact with their own environment. I don't want uh, to interact with them myself. And I'm trying to help efforts that protect these reefs so that animals like sea turtles and Napoleon wrasse, which are in trouble, can have a, a good chance to keep surviving and keep making the reef beautiful and making the reef work. All right, Addison and Aria and a couple others are wondering how long it takes coral to grow back. Maybe it gets damaged, yeah. it goes away. Yeah, well, it depends. Um, sometimes uh, corals can grow really quick and within a few years can start growing back. Um, but other corals grow really slowly. So like big boulder corals that look like rocks, they, they can um, grow really slowly, but they can also live for hundreds and thousands of years. And whereas the faster growing species like the um, branching coral I mentioned before, they can populate and colonize a reef relatively quickly. But those pictures I showed you of the reef recovering, um, that was about 10 years after the, re the reef was completely wiped out. And so it does take a bit of time. And like I said, corals can recover. The concern right now though, is that between big events like cyclones or hurricanes or bleaching events, that time to recover is getting shorter and shorter lately. So my hope is that we can work to give coral reefs the time and the space that they need to grow back. Awesome. All right, let's go to Ryan and Lucy for the next question. Um, how do you think commercial fishing impacts the reefs? and the animals that live in it? That is an excellent question. And it's a tough one to answer because there are so many different types of fishing practices and so many different types of fish that are fished. And when done well, uh, sustainable uh, fishing that is well monitored and doesn't target endangered species, is really good. It's really good for people. It's really good for the reef and keeps them healthy and doesn't catch more fish than um, that at faster than the rate that the fish can reproduce. And however, a big problem is um, kind of industrial fishing and uh, something that a lot of people are working hard to stop is something called IUU fishing, which is illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing. So there's a lot of illegal fishing that goes on in the ocean, unfortunately and not a lot of ways to enforce and regulate. Uh, and so one way that people are trying to solve this is using satellites to try to track illegal fishers and prevent it. And it's also hard to tell where your seafood comes from sometimes. And so something I like to use is the Seafood Watch app um, from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which has really good science-based information on how to choose sustainably sourced uh, fish. 
So I highly recommend that. And I'm really glad you asked that question. I'm sorry it's not as clear, um, but uh, commercial fishing can be done really well. It can also be done really poorly in a way that damages the reef and other ocean ecosystems. Brilliant, well, thank you for that. Let's move to the Burns family for our next question. Your microphone's on. I was wondering, um, what is the biggest change that kids can do to help the reefs? Thank you so much for asking that question. That's so wonderful. Um, like I mentioned before, thinking about where your food comes from or thinking about um, you know, what's happening in your local environment. You mentioned the Jubilee. And so I think it's really wonderful that you're asking these questions and looking for the answers and thinking of ways to talk to other people that can make changes. And so for me, thinking about how you eat, how you use energy and you know, how you talk to others, I really encourage you to ask more questions about the environment around you and share the knowledge that you gain. Um, because I think we're, we're all in this together and we, um, we have so much good information out there that we can really learn from each other and solve a lot of these problems. We've got some folks online wondering what the rarest animal you've ever gone on a dive with is. <sighs> rarest animal. Ooh, um, when I was in Palau, I saw a black manta ray, which is really rare. Usually the manta rays are sort of white um, on their bellies and a kind of a grayish color. I think I showed an image before, but um, on one dive, I saw a melanistic manta, which floated over the reef at me. And I was just stunned because I never expected to see one. And they, they, um, he looked a little bit like Batman. <laughs> That's amazing. All right, let's, Luke and Chloe, I see your hands up. Your microphone is on. Why don't we do one more question? Okay, so where did you do your open water dive? Great question. So I live in California and I did my uh, dive training in Monterey Bay. So I did my open water dive in Monterey with all the kelp forests and the sea lions and it was just amazing. And the water was really cold and the, you couldn't see very far ahead. So um, I feel like if I can dive there, I can dive anywhere. And so. That's um, diving in Monterey Bay helped me um, get interested in diving all over the world. That's spectacular. And Erica, if students out there are really inspired by your work, how would you suggest they go about maybe making a difference? Well, I would love it if you would um, look at some of the things that I've created with my team at the Hydras. Like I said, we have some uh, 360 degree immersive content that I would love to share with you. We also have um, 3D coral models that I'd love for you to download and learn more about. And just like the Burns family asked, you know, think about where your food comes from, ask questions, think about how you use energy and how you can help your local environment. Um, and I really want you to follow your curiosity and ask questions and make discoveries because that's what science and exploration is all about. Brilliant. We've got one really, really cool. I was going to wrap it up, but there's such a cool question in the chat bar. Uh, you've been mentioning, Erica, a lot about the different ages that different kind of fish and other things can get to in the ocean. How are you able to tell how old they can get? Is it something Ooh, where they look? Is it is great it question? So that ranges. So for corals, the reason we know that they can be hundreds or thousands of years old is because I mentioned they deposit calcium carbonate. So each generation of coral animal builds up over time. And so they produce these layers that are kind of like tree rings. So if you've heard about how if you cut a tree in half, you can count how many rings are there to see how old the tree is. You can do something like that for corals, which is really, really cool. And so we can look at the geological history and have this amazing record. And then for fish, uh, fish have these special ear bones called otoliths. And you can do something similar there where you count the rings to see their age. Now there are a few types of animals where we just don't know how old they are because we don't know a lot about them. And manta rays is, is one of those examples. And the best estimations come from seeing the same 
individual that you can tell is the same manta ray because they have certain markings on their belly that are kind of like fingerprints. So you, if you have photographs of the same manta, you can see over the years how long they're on that reef and make an estimation of how old they might get. But because we um, you know, don't watch them all the time and the ocean's a big place, there's still a lot we don't know. It sounds like lots and lots of projects for everyone watching right now, right? There's so totally. much to learn. All right, Erica, do you have any last advice for all the young explorers out there today? <sighs> I'm just so glad that you came with me on this adventure today, and I hope that the adventure continues for you. Love that. All right, folks. Well, if you'd like that adventure to continue with Nat Geo Education, you can check out our Explorer Classroom schedule as well as many, many more educational resources at natgeoed.org. We hope to see you at our upcoming events. We do this every single day at two o'clock Eastern. So, oh, I'm sorry, every single weekday, I should clarify, at two o'clock Eastern. So I'd love to see you again. And you can tune in tomorrow to learn all about deep sea amphipods with awesome. oceanographer Chloe Nunn. Um, all right, before we leave, I'm going to turn on everybody's microphone nice and loud. Let's say goodbye and thank you to Erica. Ready? Thank you. Thank you.